A girl awakens in her bed hidden behind a blanket in the Empire's grand celebration when people assemble in the streets all night. Elran flushes as she realizes she's naked, her thoughts racing with memories of how she ended up here in this strange situation. Twelve hours before amidst the festivities and the flowing wine, she enjoyed the fun with her companions. Her companions encourage her to drink more, pushing her to her limits. Among their banter, one of her friends mentioned individuals who promised allegiance to the Emperor, declaring they would join him hereafter. Confused, Elran inquired innocently about the harm she had done, only to be confronted with the charge that her comments had tarnished the Emperor's name. Angered, she rose, about to leave, but her companions begged her to stay, a little longer. She exited the house and missed a sea of adorned buildings and a brilliant full moon overhead, with deep apologies. Her mood changed instantly and she was overcome with a delight she had not felt in a long time. She danced with the crowd, joining hands with a stranger and encouraging him to join in the fun by her side. She eventually found herself in his home, dozing off. As she rises from the bed, pain shooting through her body, she cast a glimpse at the man sleeping in an adjacent room, thinking that she'd been persuaded he was more attractive. Her gaze is drawn to the man's neck, decorated with a necklace of amaranth, the fabled jewelry fashioned by the disappeared artist. Its owner, the last survivor of the royal family, was the object of Emperor Karat's fury, having eliminated every other member and harboring content for everyone who clung to him, even those wanting a single night of passion. Ilran decides to escape the premises, her relief is obvious upon her return home. She leaves her home to prepare for work, passing through the hallways of the Emperor's palace, when her chatty friend, Sun Baiman, interrupts her, inquiring about the happenings of the festival night and questioning her early departure. Sun Baiman's chattiness erates Iron. The arrival of Captain Leinonhart, the revered commander of the Crescent Duchy and the youngest captain, puts an end to the chit-chat. He warns Sun Bum that their first mission is to protect the Majesty and not to engage in frivolous chat. Then, turning to Iran, Leonhart invites her to follow him to the king's presence. Fear of being detected on route, Iran agrees to accompany Leonhart to face the Magnificence. When they arrive, Emperor Karat swivels his focus towards them, inquiring about the happenings of the festival's final night and their thoughts on personal interactions between a man and a woman on such an occasion. This unexpected question catches them unprepared. Nonetheless, Leonhardt strongly states that there is no impropriety as long as mutual consent exists. The king then requests Ilran's opinion, which causes her thoughts to rush as she wonders if he has discovered her secret. Struggling to find an appropriate explanation, she eventually asserts that such relationships are formed through interwoven hearts, despite the king's preference for restricted physical contact before marriage. The king dismisses them with a smile, and as they leave the room, Ilran breathes a sigh of relief, grateful for her near escape. Meanwhile, sat in his regal chair, the king's reflection mirrored at his tea, wearing a knowing grin, repeating Ilran's words, Connected hearts. Leon approaches Ilran while in a state of bewilderment and inquires about the nature of her worried demeanor. Ilran diverts attention away from his worry by bringing up the peculiar questions posed by the king and musing aloud about the king's recent shift in behavior. Leon demonstrates his comprehension by nodding and moving away after hearing her response. After a few months, Ilran begins to suffer from excruciating headaches and realizes that she has not had her monthly cycle. She reasons that it's due to stress and mulls over going to a doctor, but ultimately decides that the discretion and safety offered by the Black Alley doctor are more important to her. She wears her black coat before going to the doctor's office to make an appointment. She considers the potential that her delayed period may not be primarily due to stress, and she does it while seated in an examination chair. She thinks about the possibility of alternative causes. Because she's concerned for her safety, she decides to go this covert route rather than visit a traditional clinic. The physician starts by asking the patient about her symptoms and then instructs her to remove some of her clothing so that he can examine her more thoroughly. She opens up about her predicament, including specifics of the evening during the festival. After performing a meticulous examination on Iran using a stethoscope, this physician makes a startling discovery and informs her that she's expecting a child. As the months pass, Elrond is left feeling overpowered by the information that was revealed to her, and as a result, he becomes increasingly weak and occasionally throws up. When she's in the same room as the king, her heart beats quickly because she's terrified that he will discover the truth. While Leon is accompanying her into the palace corridor, he shows concern for her health, to which she responds by dismissing it as a simple case of seasonal sickness. Leon, unconvinced, proposes that she see a doctor who practices in his neighborhood. However, Elrond believes that her physician is sufficient and she avoids his subject. Leon brings up the forthcoming inquiry session as the conversation shift gears and asks her whether she's ready. Ilran intrigued questions the inquiry that will take place in a few weeks. 
Leon explains that the higher authorities have postponed the investigation dates and he allows her to withdraw from the process if she feels ill. Elrond is unyielding in its insistence that she will be there for the investigation. Leon checks with the commander to see whether all soldiers are present as they congregate in the large hall. The commander affirms that they are ready and states that they may begin the assembling now that the final group has arrived. Leon inquires Elron once more about the cause of her condition after noticing that her skin is quite pale. However, she provides the same explanation each time. During their discussion, they enter the king's chamber and find him seated in his chair, intently reading a rumor circulating throughout the city. The king himself has propagated this rumor, therefore it's likely that he is the source of it. Elrond's discomfort increases when the cook serves grilled meat for the king to consume while Elrond is standing next to the king. Seeing it makes her feel queasy and she struggles to control the impulse to throw up, while desperately trying to keep her mouth closed. She knows that any sign of illness before the king could mean danger, so she averts her gaze as the cook brings tangerines. The sight of the tangerines causes her tremendous cravings for them, but she does not dare ask for a piece of them. She has decided to give up, and while making arrangements to buy tangerines on her way home, she suddenly realized that the fruit was out of season and would be prohibitively expensive. While she's preoccupied with the fruit, her stomach begins to grumble, drawing the notice of the king, who's standing very close to her. She takes a deep breath and rests her hands on the king's shoulder, only to immediately realize that she's done something wrong. She then falls to her knees and begs for forgiveness. At this point, the king goes to Leon and asks why he is not ensured that his knights have sufficient food to eat. Elrond jumps in and argues that it's not the captain's responsibility but her own because she was motivated by personal concerns. Although the king orders Leon to leave the room, Leon initially refuses to obey the order. The monarch warns him that his statements will not be repeated, ultimately resulting in Leon leaving the kingdom. Now that he and Elrond are alone, the king questions her about why she's put her health to this side while participating in the Empire's duties. Elrond shares that she's put on weight recently and decided to lose part of it. The king reprimands her and emphasizes that she should not let her outward appearance affect her performance as a knight. After receiving a nod of assent from her, the king motions to an empty chair close by and invites her to join him there. She initially balks, but in the end she agrees to comply. The monarch makes a request for food for Elrond, at which point the chef is called, and several different foods such as pudding, pizza, and fresh juices are served in front of her. Because he realized that she must have been starving for days, he insists that she eat the meal offered to her. Elrond, upset by the smell, fights off the impulse to throw up and avoids eating. However, out of worry that the monarch may suspect her, she grudgingly starts eating to dispel any uncertainties that he might have. Fearing the king's inspection, Elrond reluctantly decides to consume part of the meal. She forced herself to eat, aware that the king's stare stayed fixated on her, refusing to abandon her until she finished her meal. Leon enters the room just as he struggles with the food, falling to his knees and begging the king for pardon for abandoning his knights. Elrond is perplexed by Leon's behavior because she believes her illness is entirely to blame for her worsening health. Leon approaches Elrond and begs her for forgiveness, admitting that he should have seen her deteriorating condition. The king mulls over the problem, noting that if any of his knights become ill, they must seek prompt treatment from the royal physician. Elrond is then instructed to accompany him to the royal clinic. Time passes and Elrond lies on a bed while the king waits for the physician nearby. Fear fills her as she fears her secret will be revealed with no possibility of salvation. The physician enters the room unexpectedly until Elrond's surprise, it's the same doctor from the back alley. After initially exploring the idea of a twin brother, she realizes it is the same physician. She needs clarification on how a royal physician can operate a separate clinic in a back alley while still being required in the palace. Her thoughts are interrupted when the doctor begins to examine her. He notifies the king of the findings of the examination. Elrond closes her eyes, unable to muster to hear the truth. The physician informs the king that Elrond has slight food poisoning and acute indigestion, most likely due to eating something rotten on festival night. Elrond agrees, marveling at how the doctor lies to protect her in front of the monarch. The monarch instructs his chef to prepare the required diet for his knight, expressing his displeasure at having any sick members in his army. Elrond devours the meal like a wild beast in a voracious state briefly forgetting the king's presence. She quickly stops eating and looks at the king, realizing her impropriety. Before leaving the room, the king rises and tells her to take better care of herself. The cook observes that she barely saw the king staring at them and that it is the first time she's seen him grin. Elron seeks consolation in the royal bed, hoping to sleep, but her mind wanders back to another time when the king smiled, when they were close and he shouted out someone's name. She shakes her head, unable to recollect what word he said, attempting to ignore the memories and drift into oblivion. However, the king enters the room discreetly while she's sleeping. This scene proceeds with the king sitting on the bed next to Elrond and playing with the strands of her hair. 
Ilran is jolted awake by his presence and she quickly concludes that it must be impossible for the king to be in her room, believing it must be a dream instead. She is startled by his presence. She tries to fall back asleep by closing her eyes, but the king continues his act, this time with a smile on his face. She eventually gives up and succumbs to sleep. Elrond wakes up and sits up, expressing her skepticism and wondering aloud how the king could visit her in her dreams. In answer, he tenderly touches her chin while gazing into her eyes and admits that he's been thinking about her a lot. When Elrond finally opens her eyes, she finds that she's been dreaming the entire time. A few days later, Elrond tells Leon that she's concluded that the king is a terrible man while walking together in the corridor. Leon nods in agreement and acknowledges that it would be unreasonable to expect compassion from him. Nevertheless, he notes that the king appears to have a soft place for Elrond. As they make their way back to the king's chambers, they continue to carry on their discussion. The monarch inquires about the responsibilities he bestowed upon them, and both respond positively. The monarch interviews them to learn why they've gathered together despite having varied roles to play in the kingdom. Amid their journey to see his majesty, Leon improvises a story in which they say they ran into each other by chance. The king is content with the explanation, so he orders Leon to return to his post, and Leon complies with the instruction. Soon after, Lady walks in and tells the king that Baron Fabian's daughter wants to talk with him. She does this as soon as she enters the chamber. Because he's deeply involved in what he's reading, the monarch requests that the woman waits without looking at him. After waiting a while, he and Ilron entered the guest room. When the Baron's daughter set up to speak, the monarch cut her off and demanded that she get right to the point. The Baron's daughter was attempting to introduce herself. She added that the king had ordered her to find the girl he'd spent the night with during the celebration, but owing to the darkness, no one remembers her identity or the qualities that distinguish her from the others. After a brief pause, she gives a sly smile before revealing that she was the one who spent the previous night with the monarch. Ilran is left standing there bewildered by the girl's blatant falsehood, while the king's look suddenly takes on an odd quality. The girl was to be evacuated from the palace immediately, and the king left the chamber without saying a word as he turned his head and started walking out of the room. Walking alongside the king at the time, Ilran makes the most of the chance by asking him what he would do if he found out that the woman with whom he had spent the night was pregnant. The monarch takes a moment to pause and looks at the girl before adamantly declaring that a scenario like that would never happen, and labeling the child's assertion as a fabrication. While he moves forward, Ilran stays put, her hand resting on her stomach as she thinks about the possibility that the truth will never be revealed. He keeps moving forward. Emperor Kylart says the person would be lying, and he would punish them for it. Hearing things, Elon thinks that secret can never come to light. Leonhard sees Elon write and asks her if she's sick. Elon says she's fine and is just tired. Leon's sister Arisa arrives and he acts cold towards her. Arisa says Elon is just as serious as Leonhardt, who tells her to say why she's there. Arisa says she came to see the Emperor and goes off. Leonhardt asks Arisa if the noble's daughter who met the Emperor was Mickey, but she feigns ignorance and leaves. Elon asks who Mickey is and Leonhardt says that they're scum who confirm rumors to check the Emperor's response and use innocent people. Elon is shocked to see what Leonhardt thinks of his sister. Leonhardt says he thinks of her as a snake-like child and tells her to keep her distance from her. Elon thinks that it's time for the Emperor to meet the Empress and he's become more tolerant of people but to ensure that it's safe, Mickey has to be sacrificed and it's scary that she would be sent with a chance to be killed, just to gain an advantage. While sleeping, Kyler comes in her dream again telling her to sleep and stay healthy. She calls him Majesty but he tells her to call him Kyle as a term of affection. She wonders why he's talking like that and calls him Kyle. Kyle asks where it hurts and she says that she's just pathetic because she's dreaming this because she wants it. Kyle hugs her and assures that it isn't pathetic. She asks him what he talked with Arisa about, but he tells her to wait a bit and she wishes her dream would never end. Elan's buddy is recovering, but her heart feels uneasy due to the court physician, Arisa coming more, but mainly because of her dream. Even though she's tired from her work, she still gets harassed in her dreams and wishes for her heart to become sunny. She begins dreaming and finds herself sitting in Kyle's lap, and she realizes that in reality she must be sleeping in front of the Emperor and leaving him unguarded, so she decides to immediately wake up. Elan wakes up and looks for the Emperor, but jumps up when he realizes that she's sitting in his lap. She kneels and apologizes to him and wonders how she fell asleep on his lap. She wonders if she's still dreaming and calls Kyle to see his response. Arisa has seen all this and leaves as Elan looks towards her. Elan wonders how much Arisa had seen and Kyle says that this is annoying. Hearing his cold voice, she realizes he isn't Kyle and decides not to confuse reality with dreams as it will ruin her peaceful life. Kyle tells Elan that her escort task ends with the night's dinner and orders her to return to her original post. 
Alon wonders why she's keeping her by his side till she gets better, and she likes it but also feels sad as she feels she's losing something, and wonders if it's because of the child as the problem isn't solved yet. She thinks she can't lose focus and wonders what Kyle would think about the child's problem, and decides to stop thinking about Kyle and making herself sad and decides to be happy about being away from the Emperor. Arisa cries and tramples over some flowers sad at what she had just seen. Alon hopes Arisa won't have a weird misunderstanding and eats alone due to not wanting to make others worry about her, and celebrates being away from the Emperor and gets excited eating a tangerine. Leonhard seats Alon alone and calls her which surprises her, making her drop the tangerine. She thinks normally she would have caught it. Leonhard sees Alon crying and asks if it's because she's still in pain and if she's hurting anywhere. Alon thinks she can't say she's crying because the tangerine got dirt on it and remembers that because the way the body changes during pregnancy, she won't be able to control her emotions and blames her pregnancy. Seeing the captain worry about her, she decides to stop crying and says that she's fine, and remembers that she bought extra tangerines. Leonhard wipes her tears and tells her to stop crying. The others are shocked at the captain acting so kind. Alon tries to stop herself, but she blurts out that the captain scared her, causing her to drop the tangerine, which confuses him. The others think that they heard wrong and Alon thinks she's gone mad and thinks everyone will think she's weird. Leonhard apologizes to her, saying he was careless and asks why the tangerine was so special. Leon thinks she bought it only to eat it and there wasn't anything special. Leonhard says he won't be able to cover up her wound and takes responsibility. Alon asks how he'll do that. Leonhard says Alon must be going through a hard time so they should leave and says he's serious about letting him know what's bothering her and wants to be her pillar of support and leaves, saying he doesn't want to make it hard for her. Alon is glad it ended well for her and feels bad for troubling everyone and didn't realize she couldn't control her emotions this much. The next day, Alon sees a large amount of tangerine, which is a gift from the captain, and they aren't all of them. Alon is happy that Leonhard gave her so many tangerines, but it's impossible for her to eat them on her own. The others cry that they will turn orange eating so many tangerines. Alon brings some tangerines to the men who try to decline, but another man takes them and accepts it, saying he will eat them all. Alon puts the basket back and thinks about going to the armory and swinging a sword. The physician told her to take it easy, but thinks it should be fine as she reduced the hours of her training. Suddenly, a person pushes her off the stairs and she worries about the baby. She gets up wondering who did it and thinks of going to the palace. She tries to get up but can't move from the pain, so she tries to call for help but can't due to the severity of her abdominal pain. She thinks that Kyle is coming to help her but it turns out to be Leonhard. She says to go to the palace but he says the infirmary in the knight's quarters is closer, but she insists about the palace and he carries her. She wonders why she saw Kyle's face and wonders if she wanted him to come help her and she can't stop thinking about him. Alon lies in pain as Leonhardt brings the doctor and tells him to check on her, saying she was kidnapped at work. He tells her to make herself comfortable and asks the captain to step out, but he refuses. But the doctor pushes him out, asking for a clean towel and hot water. He asks her what happened and she says that she fell down the stairs. He takes a look and says that the baby is fine and tells her that she'll be fine after some medicine. Suddenly, the captain enters and Alon gets up in pain. The doctor asks about the towels and the hot water and he says he told a servant. The doctor says someone else knowing the information would make things complicated. Leonard asks if it's true, but the doctor tries feigning ignorance, but Leonard asks again, and the doctor says he hates quick-witted people because of things like this. Leonard asks why she hid that, and she says she can't say why. Leonard asks who the father is, and she refuses to answer. He asks if she will keep it alone, and she says she will do so. Elon wonders if she should leave the palace hoping to make money with a neighborhood watch and if the captain will keep her secret, and thinks about begging him. Leonard asks to be the dad, surprising everyone. Elon asks Leonard if he likes her, and he says he thought she was cool ever since he saw her, which makes her happy. Elon says she has no reason to accept his feelings, but he tells her not to rush, saying he will stay by her side, and leaves to go get some hot water for her. Elon asks the doctor if she's dreaming, who says this is reality. She wonders if the captain was serious about what he said. Outside, the captain punches a wall in anger. The doctor sees the captain taking his anger out in a wall and understands it, as he doesn't even know who the father is, and he has to let the woman he loves go. The doctor sees a shadow and asks if they're there to report to their owner, and wonders if they'll be punished for not protecting the target, and wonders what Elan will do now. Elan had been thinking of what to do if she got caught and is relieved that the captain is not one to probe, and he even told her to rest for a few days and thinks he's so nice. 
Suddenly, she smells some tasty food and goes towards the lady holding the bread. Alon thinks she shouldn't eat it worrying about throwing up because of morning sickness, but it smells so good, so she decides to get one anyway. She takes a bite and it tastes so good that she asks her for 10 bags. She's glad to not face morning sickness. Kyle sits deep in his thoughts when the man arrives asking to be allowed to track the poison, but Kyle says it isn't poison, at which the man suggested may be a curse. But Kyle stops him and summons the court physician. The physician gets thrown in front of the emperor who asks why he's been summoned. The emperor says he's repulsed by the smell of the food and the thought of it makes him nauseous and asks what's wrong with him. The doctor says this isn't a poison or a curse. The men there realize what the symptoms are similar to and the emperor understands what it actually is. At night, Alon lies in her bed happy about the meat pie she ate and says eating it was so fun and wants every day to be like this. Kyle again appears in her dream saying he wants to visit every day but he's been busy lately, saying he had a lot of things to do. Alon looks at him and worries about being so thin and says his arms look dry and asks if he's hurt anywhere. He replies he doesn't know and changes the topic saying that it's good she's gained weight and asks what happened to her. Alon cheerfully says she's been having good meals lately and talks about the steak she had for dinner. Kyle asks if she likes meat and Alon says she does and tells Kyle to always eat what he craves. He sets his head in her lap and agrees to do it. Kyle asks Alon if she would accept someone's proposal at which she thinks she needs to give a proper reason to Leon Hart and says she'll probably end up rejecting him. Kyle begins touching Alon's thigh and she says she doesn't like it at which she says she can touch him too, to be even, and asks her to stay with him. The next morning, Alon gets up and quickly runs to the market and gets so sad that the stall selling chicken skewers isn't open. Alon tells the doctor about it who tells her to eat whatever she wants. Suddenly, Leonhardt enters saying he will help her, and she thinks it would be easier but feels inappropriate as they're still on duty. The doctor says he's free so he will go by them, making her very happy and she thanks him. Later, the doctor shows her the chicken skewers but she apologizes saying he can't eat it and says she wants fruits now. The doctor says it's natural for her cravings to frequently change and goes to buy the fruits while eating the skewers. The doctor hands her the fruits and she asks how he got them so quickly, and he says he has connections. Alon wonders what kind of connections he has and thinks he's suspicious. Despite the confidentiality contract, she can't relax and he also knew about her recovery and improvement in health. So she thinks someone is keeping an eye on her and thinks it may be the doctor or Arisa, as she had been spiteful towards all the women who approached the Emperor, and had seen her in the Emperor's lap. She goes to ask the captain but is surprised to find that he has been dispatched to a different region. He has gone to the Northern District and the Vice Captain will be covering his position. The Northern District has suffered from a barbarian invasion and normally the Imperial Knights would guard the Emperor so she wonders why he went there and thinks that it's a punishment. The doctor greets her and asks him about Leon Hart on the off chance she knows, and she suspects his eyes as he says he doesn't know. She runs thinking nothing is working out for her and thinks to leave wondering why she keeps dreaming about Kyle and feels disheartened. Alon's resignation gets rejected on the basis that her diagnosis has to be accredited by three members of the Imperial Clinic, but she would get caught then, which will lead to her death at the hands of the Emperor or Arisa. If she stays, she will get caught due to the physical changes of her body, so she decides to run away at night. She decides to camp and sits atop a tree to not be spotted and tries to rest despite being uncomfortable and spots Shadow Knights below and thinks they are after her. The Shadow Knights go away and she decides to rest. Kyle appears in her dream and asks why she left. She says she felt her health declining at which Kyle says he will hire the best physicians to treat her and ask her to come back. But she thinks this kind Kyle is only in her dreams and the real Emperor is a cruel man and says that she can't be treated and she won't tell him about the illness. He angrily asks her if she ran away because she hates him and he grabs her stomach and says there's nothing he doesn't know so she shouldn't lie to her and asks if she's pregnant with his child. Kyle says he will forgive her if she returns and asks her to stay with his side as it's their child and he is known from the beginning. Alon realizes that it's both a dream and reality. Kyle says that she's the mother of his child and in the future she will stand with his side and the child will be a successor. She refuses saying despite him knowing he only watched her in his dream and says she hates liars. Kyle then says that she'll bring her back with force and she jolts awake. She tries to get back to her horse but a shadow knight appears saying the emperor has called for her and if she runs now it'll be considered treason and they don't want to hurt her so they ask her not to fight. Alon stabs the knight in the head and tries to run away and thinks Kyle's been keeping an eye on her through her dreams and she suffered through so much for no reason and he acted so kind to her in her dream and he wants her to be his empress and she cries that he just watched her suffer. 
She manages to hide and thinks what to do is Kyle will appear if she falls asleep. Thinking Kyle casted a spell, she decides to elend the City of Sages to deal with it and dyes her hair black to stay under the radar. Elan enters a line in the City of Sages and tries to find a sage who can help her. The sage says the spell connects the caster with the one they love through their dreams. Elan asks if there's a way to undo it, but the mage says that there's no known way to break it. And one workaround it is to travel far away from its caster, and if she distanced herself from the caster, the ability to connect in dreams would weaken. Elan thanks him for help and leaves. Elan thinks to run farther away, but her stomach is beginning to show, and eventually it will get hard for her to move. Kyle is angry at his Shadow Knights and orders to send a notice to find Elan, and close the borders, and says she must not be harmed no matter what. Kyle thinks Elan wasn't close to the knights with her, so if he takes them hostage, she wouldn't bat an eye. Elan is now wanted for the crime of treason against the Imperial family. Leonhard is shown a wanted poster of Elan, which confuses him, but he remembers Elan being worried and not telling him who the father is. And he realizes that the Emperor may be the father of Elan's child, as the Imperial physician was assigned to her, and wonders why she ran away and thinks if she really loved him, there'd be no reason for her to flee, and it doesn't make sense, and wonders if she had any say in it and if she's scared. Leonhard had lost his parents in an accident due to the Emperor's doing, and he had vowed revenge. But now he's losing another loved one to him and gets angry and decides to return to the capital and stay with the Emperor to get more information. He gets a message that the Emperor is requesting his return to the capital and he wonders what the Emperor is scheming, and he thinks it's his chance now. A few months later, Alon gets told to take a break. Alon now goes by the name of Ron and gets told to take care of her health. At first, everyone had kept their distance from her, but once they heard that the father of the child rejected her, they warmed up to her, but she's still having a hard time getting used to their kindness. A woman asks her about prenatal care, but she doesn't know about it. She explains that everything she does affects the baby inside her, so she needs to ensure that she has a positive effect on it, so she should look at beautiful things and say lovely words. The woman jokes that the way Ren speaks reminds her of how soldiers speak and says she should tell her baby how much she loves them. She thinks about it and begins talking nicely to her unborn baby, saying she loves them and wants to live a happy life with them and thinks to make sure they'll have a wonderful life. Time passed by and she went through a lot of hardships while carrying the baby, but thanks to the help of the villagers, she was able to get through it and eventually she successfully gave birth to twins, a girl and a boy. She has decided to name her daughter Leanne and son Enril and gets happy that she can use both names and tells her kids that they will have a wonderful life together. Elan tries to put in Rel to sleep and she realizes her eyes are sparkling gold just like the Emperor's. She was worried she wouldn't be able to love her babies if they resembled the Emperor, but she has no problem now. And Rel is quiet and mild-mannered while Leanne is full of energy and the twins are too different from each other. She thinks they won't end up like the Emperor as they are her children. Elan thinks that raising two babies is hard and they are getting heavier and have such big appetites that she has to feed them goat's milk. But she's glad to see that they are growing well. She's a nightmare about the Emperor finding her and wakes up to see her babies. Alon walks over to her sleeping babies and says that she will protect them. Two Shadow Knights enter the room, but they just missed Alon, and they say she's really good at hiding her traces. One of them finds a doll indicating that Alon has a child with her and then moves out as they don't want to disappoint the Emperor once more. Alon makes food for the kids who are now five years old. They have been constantly moving from one place to the other as the kids got older, it became easier to move around. But they can't live like this forever, but she hopes Kyle has given up on trying to find her. Someone knocks on the door and Alon tells the kids to keep eating and she goes to check who it is. She recognizes the voice and replies that no one is home. Leanne springs up and asks if it's Mr. Alvare and Alon says no. Leanne recognizes him from the voice and goes to open the door. Alvare thanks Leanne for opening the door and gives her some meat as a present. Alvare was part of a group of strangers who came to the town who thought they were runaway aristocrats, so people kept their distance at first. But due to Alvare's personality, they warmed up to him in no time. But she still hasn't. Elan tells Leanne to finish her food. Later, Elan prepares to go out, but Alvare wants to help her pick the basket up. Elan says that he knows where he's going and says that she's going to dig up some herbs. Elan says she doesn't have to come with, but he says he wants to. Leanne also wants to go, so she says that they will all go. While leaving, a woman asks where they're going and Elan responds that they're going to the mountains, at which she warns them of the wild boars. 
a group of men gossip about the state of the country and foreigners poking around looking for someone, hearing that she gets worried that the Shadow Knights are still looking for her, but decides to not fall into panic from a few rumors. She sees Alvair spacing out and thinks he hates the Empire and jabs at him. They are picking up herbs when suddenly a wild boar appears. The boar is injured as it's running away from a hunter. Alon realizes the danger and tells Elaine and Enril to be quiet. The boar approaches Elon, who thinks she can take it down even without a weapon, but that risks Elvira finding out she used to be at night. So she decides to act like an ordinary human and run away and acts weak. Elvira says he will handle it, but Elon thinks he's being an idiot. Elvira takes his sword out and goes to attack the boar, but the boar ignores him and heads towards Elon. But she isn't scared and thinks that even though it's been a while since she has used a weapon, the boar should be no problem for her and prepares to fight it with her knife. The boar heads towards her and she brings it down with a single strike and then hands the bloody knife to Alvera and checks on her kids. The hunters arrive and ask Alvera if he's the one who killed the boar, but he points to Alon saying she's the one who killed it. But she says that Alvera took care of everything. Alvera gets the hit and says he's the one who killed the boar. Making the hunters amazed, he did it with only a dagger. And Rill says that his mom was the one who killed the boar and she says no, at which Leanne says Alon told them to not lie. But she says this kind of lie is fine. Leanne asks if it's because the Demon King will come after them and people find out who they are, and she says yes, so that they will keep the secret. Once the kids got old enough, Elan told them that a bad man is chasing after them so they think an evil Demon King is after them, and they think to wait until they get older to tell the whole story. Elvira tells Elan that the hunters left and butchered the boar and gave them a portion of it, at which Elan tells them to have it. Elvira tells her to keep it as a present. Elan thinks she won't have to worry about meat and leather now and wonders what to do with the fang. She'd asked the merchant to sell it, but he refused and no one is going to the city. So she decides to go to the city the next day to gather information while trying to sell it and tells the kids she will be back soon. After selling the herb, she decides to buy the things she needs, but decides to rest first. She begins dreaming and as she falls asleep when she sits down and Kyle enters her dream. Elan turns around and sees Kyle who asks her if she dyed her hair brown. He says he's been looking everywhere for her. Elan realizes it isn't a nightmare, and the fact he appeared in her dream means he's close by. Kyle says Elan keeps trying to get away from him, but she says she only went where she wanted to and tells him it's useless for him to try and track her, and tells him to stop chasing after her as she's willing to spend the night of the festival with her, but he had no choice in what happened after it. Kyle asks if she was ever interested in him, at which she thinks she was drawn to him, but after she learned that he planned everything from the shadows, she became afraid of him. Elan lies that she was never interested in him, but Kyle tells her that she will return to the Empire with him and ask what happened to the child, and she lies saying she couldn't give birth to them. Kyle says it's fine as they can always make another one and tells her to follow her. Elan thinks something's wrong as Kyle's a lot calmer than usual, and thinks he may be doing something in the real world and wakes up from the dream by falling off her chair and thinks if she goes home she may be followed, so she decides to shake off the people following her. Late at night, the kids discussing turn on the lights, but Elan had told them not to do so in the loan, but they still light a candle and decide to blow it out before sleeping. From the outside, loud noises appear, but they quickly stop. Alver knocks on the door asking for Rand, but the kids say she's gone out, and he leaves telling them to say they don't know anything, in case someone comes around asking. Leanne opens the door and sees the yard's a mess, and then closes the door, but a Shadow Knight keeps them from doing so. The Knight asks the kids if they live there and asks about Albert, but they don't know anything. Leonhard says that anyone who rebels is to be arrested and says to arrest them as the rebels came so they must be involved. Leonhard thinks the kids look like someone he knows and asks for their names. He wonders if these kids are the kids Elaine had with the Emperor and heads to the Emperor, and wonders how hard it was for her to raise them on her own. The knight tells the emperor that they found the two kids who appear to be involved with the rebels and they arrested them as they may know something. Leanne thinks that the emperor is the evil one from the stories. The emperor asks Leanne her age and she answers that it's five years old. The emperor asks how the Elaine search is going and the knight reports that she was living in the village but moved recently. The emperor says for the kids to be given a bath. And Enril asks to be let go and if he will eat them. The knight says the emperor doesn't eat humans at which she asks if they will be tortured at which the knight says the emperor doesn't torture without a reason. He then gets up and says that they look like their mother, and he knows her well and asks if they know who their father is, and they say they don't. The Emperor thinks Elan still rejects him, and he says that they look like each other. And Real blurts out that they aren't the evil Emperor's kids, at which he says they are, saying they look like each other. 
The kids begin crying, and the knight says that he will take them away, but the emperor stops him and says he will get something for them to eat. But they worry it is poison, but they eat it in the end and realize it's delicious. After eating, the kids fall asleep, and the emperor tells everyone to leave. Two days later, Alon sees that Enril and Leanne are gone, and sees Leonhardt and attacks him, asking where her children are. He tells her that the kids are with the emperor and tells her to run away, but she refuses to leave until she finds her children. Leonard says that there are shadow knights hiding around there, that they will detain her once they get a chance, and says he will give an opening to her to slash him and run away, and asks her to trust him. She slashes him and runs away, hoping to save her kids. The man who was helping Elvera draws her to him and praises her skills to avoid others. He had always avoided her, but now he's helping her. Elvera spots a checkpoint with the army's gear unit and can't believe that they're following the emperor's orders so much, and thinks that they aren't the only one being chased and suspects Elan. Vern brings Alon to her and he greets her, but she acts cold to him. Alon gets angry that Alvair hasn't found the twins yet and says she needs to go find her kids, but Alvair tells her it will be impossible for her to find them on her own and asks to be allowed to help her, but she says the Empire is searching for him so them being together will make things complicated. Alvair tries to convince Alon, but she says that she's done thinking that Alvair isn't trying to help her with pure intentions, and they see the Empire as their enemy is afraid of them finding out who her kids really are. Fern tries to convince Alon too, but Alvera stomps him, and as Alon leaves, he tells her that they will start moving at dawn two days later. Fern asks Alvera why he wants to help her so much, at which he says that they are the ones to blame and the kids got caught up because of them, so they need to stay true to their beliefs. Alon thinks that the Emperor has stepped out of the Empire's borders with a small number of soldiers, which is a perfect time for Alvera to make a move, and thinks to get back in shape. Suddenly, she finds Leonhardt behind her who tells her to relax and puts his weapon down, and says he wants to know if he can help her in any way. Alon asks if he isn't trying to drag her back to the Emperor, as he is his loyal knight, but he says her security comes first and says that the Emperor had killed his parents, and he had to pledge his loyalty to survive. She asks him why he trusts her, and he says that he loves her, and his proposal still stands. Alon tells him to stop teasing her and asks if her kids are safe. Leonhardt tells her that they are with the Emperor and are safe and unharmed, Hearing that, which gets her relieved. Leonhardt says they must have realized who the kid's parents are so they are unharmed. Alon goes to find her children and Leonhardt asks if he can help, but she declines. Alon thinks her body is regaining its muscle memory and plans to save her children during the chaos two days later due to Alvera's plan. Later at night, Kyle wonders why the kids are sleeping on his bed and thinks he mistook them for Alon in their sleep. He sleeps and meets Alon in a dream and she grabs him asking about her kids. Chapter 21 The Emperor calls out to Alon. She inquires about the whereabouts of the children. The Emperor says that they are his kids as well. Alon asks, what makes him think that? The Emperor knows so because the boy's eyes are a unique color like his. Alon declares that as the Emperor does not even love the children, she will take them back. The Emperor wakes up, ponders about love, and tries to remember how his mother used to love him. However, he does not remember. The children, sleeping beside the Emperor, wake up and frighten, call him the Demon King. The Emperor asks them to change out of their pajamas. The children love the new dresses he got them. The three of them sit at the table and the Emperor tells them to eat. The children are suspicious of the Emperor. They think that the Demon King is trying to fatten them up so he can eat them later, much like the witch from the gingerbread house. The Emperor listens to their chatter and questions if all kids are like them. He suddenly remembers the time when he was also chatty as a child. His mother was ill and confined to bed, so he would always tell her stories filled with adventures whenever he went to meet her. She would always pat his head. The Emperor also patted Enril's head, but it soon converted to shaking his head. The children think that he's harassing Enril and is trying to crush his head. Enril says he's alright, but Leanne is suspicious as the Emperor used too much strength. The Emperor tries one more time with Leanne and pats her right. The Emperor tells him that they are going to live in the palace. He says that if they wish to live the way they want, they need to have immense power. After the death of the Emperor's mother, his father lost all interest in him. He wanted to live peacefully, but the Empress at that time would not allow him to live peacefully. She hated his mother and wanted to erase all traces of her. She sent him to a disciplinary center in the north. At the center, they brainwashed them and turned them into assassins. He eventually forgot all the warmth and beautiful memories, the time he spent with his mother, and became a loyal assassin. Once he had enough strength, he killed the ones abusing him. All the other assassins followed him in his vengeful quest. He killed everyone who opposed him and became the emperor. Everyone rejoiced, but he did not know what to feel. One day he saw Lan in the palace and inquired about her. 
His subordinate told him that she was a commoner who became a knight due to her skills. She reminded him of the spring flowers he saw with his mother. From that day onwards, he could not help but gaze at her. He became obsessed with her and coincidentally met her during the festival night. At first, he wanted to use the children as bait, but now he wanted to spend a happy life with them. He pats the sleeping children. He orders his subordinates to protect the children as the enemy is approaching. Among the debris and commotion, Alain lands on the ground, but the Emperor finds her. He says that her plan was too obvious. Alain thinks that she broke in too soon. She calls out to him formally, but the Emperor says to call him Kyle. She refuses and demands her children, as Elver and his party can buy her a little time. The Emperor says that she'll have to defeat him first, and the two start fighting using their swords. Alain falls behind in skills because the Emperor is too powerful. He took the throne with his strength, and is a formidable opponent, and she only warmed up for a few days. The Emperor tells her to give up and the Shadow Assassins appear behind her. The Emperor tells her resistance is futile and to return to him. However, Alain remembers that the Emperor knew about her pregnancy from the start and manipulated the situation from the Shadows. He even went as far as to kidnap the children when she did not listen to him. Alain thinks that this behavior can never be called real love. If the Emperor knew what love was, he would not be doing this. He doesn't love her but only wants to own her. She places the sword against her neck and demands for her children or he will never ever see her again. The Emperor panics on the inside as he wants to live a happy life with the land and the children, but he remains calm on his face. He remains steadfast and tells the land that after she dies, the children will be of no use to him. He will get rid of them. Alain lowers the sword. Tears flowing through her eyes, carrying a painful smile, she calls the Emperor cruel. She even calls him Kyle. Watching this, the Emperor's heart throbs. He orders the Shadow Assassins to grab her and instructs them to restrain her so she cannot run away. The Emperor moves away from the scene, but his heart keeps throbbing. He does not understand this pain because he already obtained what he wanted. An assassin tells her to wear handcuffs that are adorned with jewels. She wants to see her children, but the assassin tells him that the only Emperor can permit that. Outside the Emperor's tent, he sees Leonhardt, but he avoids her gaze. In the tent, the Emperor picks her up and lies her down on the bed. He sits beside her with his back towards her. She ponders why he's not doing anything to her. She finds him attractive but scolds herself soon after thinking for that. She plans to escape by knocking off the Emperor but soon remembers that the Shadow Assassins are still around and she does not know where her children are. The next morning, the Emperor invites her to breakfast. The meal is luxurious so she is more at ease that the children are well fed. The Emperor asks about any inconveniences but Alon tells him to mind his own business. Leonard enters the tent and the Emperor tells him that he will be going back to the Empire but will be leaving a few nights to deal with the rebels. He appoints Leonhard as the one in charge of those knights. Leonhard gets shocked and thinks that the Emperor wants to keep him away from the land, but still remains calm and accepts the orders. The Emperor plans to get rid of Leonhard because he is not of any use now. He remembers how Leonhard pledged his loyalty to him to save his family. The Emperor also plans to lock Alon in the palace so she cannot run away. He thinks that doing this will make his anxiety disappear. Alvary connects the dots and finds that the children belong to the Emperor. He tells his subordinate to investigate Alon when another subordinate calls him Prince Alver. He tells him to call him by his name only. The subordinate tells him that the Emperor's forces are withdrawing. He tells him to gather everyone for a meeting and is happy that he will finally be able to avenge his country. Inside the carriage, the Emperor asks Alon if she's uncomfortable. She says that the handcuffs are uncomfortable. They say something other than that. She further wishes to not see the Emperor. The Emperor again says something other than that. She says she has no other complaint but that. He continues to work on a paper, and this makes Alan annoyed. She ponders why the Emperor did not approach her. That had given her a reason to hate him. She again scolds herself for thinking like that. It is like she loves him. They enter the Pakul Valley where the enemy ambushes them. Stones start falling from above. Alan jumps out of the carriage on a horse. She finds the carriage of her children. She tells them to hold her hand and jump. Leanne hesitates at first, but then bravely jumps on the horse. And Rill is scared. Leon encourages him and he also jumps but is not able to catch Alon. Just as he's about to fall to the ground, the Emperor catches him and asks if he's alright. When he says he's fine, he watches the Emperor smile in relief. He's surprised that the Emperor saved him and thinks that he's a nice person. Different from how his mother described him. Alon watches Kyle save Enril and is surprised herself. Just then, Leon shouts and tells her there's no road ahead. They reach the end of the road and there was a cliff ahead, but it was too late to stop or turn around the horse. The carriage falls down the cliff. Leon lies on the ground, but Alan hangs at the cliff with her hands. Alan cannot hold much longer. Her grip loosens, and she's just about to fall when the Emperor catches her with the handcuffs in her hands. He asks if this is how she's going to escape. 
She tells him to pull her up quickly if he's planning to save her. Just then, an arrow stabs the Emperor. He bleeds and blood drops falls on Leanne's face. She's shocked, but the Emperor tells him not to worry. She tries to pull her up, but the enemy finds him and shoots more arrows on him. Alon fears that he will die at this rate. She tells him to let the chain go as he will die if he stays like that. The Emperor is shocked to hear that, but Alon says this is a logical decision. He threatens her about her children after her death. However, she saw him save and rail and knows that he will also love the children. She tells him that and leaves them in his care. The Emperor says he cannot let her go. Alan watches the tears flow from his eyes as he tells her that she's too cruel. As he's about to lose the chain, a shadow assassin arrives from behind and pulls her up. Alan feels hazy and loses consciousness. She wakes up in a tent with the children sleeping beside her. She finds that she's no longer handcuffed. A shadow assassin arrives and tells her that the Emperor's life is not in danger. He tells her to visit the Emperor because the Emperor will feel better knowing she's alright. She asks what if she does something to him in his sleep. The shadow tells her that he does worry about that but the Emperor needs her. She goes to see the Emperor. He's lying on the bed looking weak. He holds her hand and says that he's happy that she came to him first. The Emperor tells her to call him by his name. She pats his head and thanks him for saving her and Enril while calling his name. He closes his eyes and says that it's a nice dream, falling asleep soon after. A shadow assassin arrives in the tent and she leaves. She returns to the tent to find that the children are awake. She tells them to sleep some more. They want to sleep with her, so she lies beside them. She remembers that the Emperor looked weak like her children when she patted him. The knights still cannot catch the rebels. During the discussion, someone suggests that there might be a spy here. Hearing that a man repels the idea awkwardly, but Leonhardt notices. He says that he also thinks that there's no spy among the knights. Leonhardt receives a letter through a pigeon and is notified of the recent attack. He fears that Alon would be in danger and plans to think of a plan. Alvera finds a wanted poster of Alon from five years ago and finds that Alon ran away from the Emperor. He also says that the person providing them support also asked not to hurt the woman being held by the Emperor. That means that Alon is a friend who is very close to the Emperor. He plans to find that person and use him to get revenge. Alon is nervous regarding the Emperor's health as he is still bedridden. She has mixed feelings that he threatened her by using her children, but also saved them. She is pacing back and forth when the children notice her. They think that she needs to use the toilet. They tell her to not hold back or she will get constipation. They tell her to eat many vegetables. She gets awkward and tells them to listen to her. Alon goes to visit the Emperor again, but he is still bedridden. She fears about being ambushed again while the Emperor is injured. The Emperor wakes up and reaches out to him. She holds his hand worriedly. The Emperor thinks this is a dream because Alon is always with him. Alon thinks that she also wishes for it to be a dream. The Emperor used to be cold, but he saved the children and she even saw him cry. She wonders if he was capable of such affection, then why was he cruel to her up until now? She pats his head. The Emperor tells her that his mother used to pat him whenever he was sick. She would sit beside him and read to him. She would read stories of dragon slayers, treasure hunters, and many others. The Emperor says that he used to love reading when he was little. Alon is shocked to hear that. He tells her that when he got a new book, he was entertained for the whole day. However, this was in the past. Now swords suited him better than books. If he is weak now, everything will be taken from him. She returns to the children. She praises and hugs them. She is worried about another ambush while the Emperor is still bedridden. In the night, Alon wakes up from the commotion. They have been ambushed. A shadow assassin comes to take them to a safe place. However, she thinks they'll be more at risk if they stay with the Emperor. She does not know if the ambushers are Alvar and his men. The shadow assassin assures her that they will be safe. They go to the Emperor's tent. He is sitting and ordering his men. And Real asks about his health and wants to say thanks, but Leanne beats him to it and says thank you to the Emperor. The Emperor smiles. The enemy finds the Emperor's tent. Alon asks the Emperor to give her a weapon. Thank you so much for watching. Please check out the other videos and make sure to subscribe and press that bell icon to know about our latest videos. The Emperor hands Alon a weapon and advances forward himself. He tells her not to push herself. Alon is surprised to find that the Emperor is going to fight himself. An enemy advances towards him declaring that the Emperor is the enemy of his kingdom. Both strike their swords. The Emperor refuses to recall doing anything to his kingdom. He further says to come at him if he wants to kill him. Both of them dash outside while fighting. Alon tells the children to hide under the bed as it is dangerous. She tells them to wait until she comes back and rushes outside. She finds the Emperor fighting two men. A man is about to stab him when Alon repels the attack and stands back to back with the Emperor. She notices the blood on his back and realizes that the Emperor is fighting despite his poor condition. She tells the Emperor that it is dangerous and continues to fight. The Emperor thinks she is even more beautiful when she wields the sword. 
They both keep fighting until morning when the reinforcements arrive. She's asking about his condition when the Emperor falls down. With his head in her lap, she calls out to him. The Emperor tells her not to worry. Alon says he does not look okay at all. She plans to call a physician when Leonhard arrives. He shows her a dark expression after looking at the situation and clenches his fist around the sword. He apologizes for being late and asks about their situation. Alon tells him that she's fine, but the Emperor moved around too much and his wounds reopen. Leonhard suggests moving the Emperor to another location and Alon agrees. The Emperor grabs her hand and calls out to her while smiling. Alon wonders why she does not want the Emperor to die like this. The Emperor wakes up and finds himself on the bed. Alon is holding his hand and sleeping with her head on the bed. The Emperor remembers the pain he felt while looking for her for the last few years. He thinks that if these wounds can keep her shackled to him, he will even risk his life for that purpose. Leonhard tells his subordinate that he will survey the area. He dashes thinking about Alon and how she cared for the Emperor and then slams his hand on the tree. He felt that Alon hated the Emperor, but there was a chance that she forgave him. He wanted to kill the Emperor. He laughed out loud saying that she was acting more like Arisa by the day. He then thinks that Alon might be returning the favor by saving her, as she does not like to be indebted to anyone. He says that he needs to act more quickly if he's going to obtain what he wants. Elvira is angry about the failure of his plan. He blocked all paths to keep the messengers from going out, but the Emperor still called for backup. He suspects that the information was leaked and believes that the sponsors assisting him may be responsible. He concludes that the sponsor might have changed his plans because he was afraid that Alon might die. He cannot lose hope and give up now. Alon wakes up and finds herself lying next to the Emperor while holding his hand. The King of the Nation comes to see the Emperor, so Alon wakes him up. The King apologizes for coming late and offers to escort the Emperor to the Empire. The Emperor glares at him and refuses his offer. A shadow assassin tells Alon about their plan to continue the journey and she asks about the Emperor's condition. The Emperor ordered the shadow to not tell her about his recovery, so the shadow tells her that the Emperor wanted to get her and the children out of danger. Alon is worried about the Emperor. She tells the children that they are going to the Empire. The children are excited and hug her. She tells them that she's going somewhere and will be back soon. She goes to meet the Emperor and meets Leonhard outside his tent. Leonhard averts his gaze. She thinks that he is unwell. She enters the tent and watches the Emperor changing his bandages. She asks about the physician, but the Emperor says that he's capable of doing this on his own. So he sends the physician back. She notices that the ointment has not been applied to the wounds because his hand cannot reach his back and offers to help. She applies the ointment and notices the Emperor trembling. She always thought that he could not feel pain. She tells him to lift his arms and she bandages his wounds. She asks if he's really going back to the Empire in this condition. The Emperor affirms and says that she's hoping that his condition will get worse, causing him to die. However, he finally reunited with her, so he will not die now. She is shocked to hear that she was worried about him since he got hurt. She shows a painful expression and tells him that he has not changed. The Emperor looks at her and says that he is how he is. In the carriage, Alon sits with her children. She avoids the Imperial Knight because she does not want to be recognized. The children are excited to see the knights and ask if their mother is a princess. She tells them that she is not the princess, but she once was a knight who protected her master. When the children ask about her master, she tells them that it is a secret. The children ask if the black-haired man is a demon king. She tells them he is not and asks if he bothered them. The children say that he told them that he was their father. Alon goes pale, but the children are understanding and tells her to say it later if she is uncomfortable. Her heart softens to find that her children are being considerate of her. They arrive at the palace, but Alon is worried about getting out of the carriage. And there's many people outside. Two shadow assassins arrive and give her a hood to wear. Alon does not understand if the emperor is being considerate of her or what he is thinking. They take Alon and the kids to a beautiful room. The children see the huge bed and start jumping on it excitedly. Alon tells them to not make too much noise when someone knocks at the door. She goes to check to find Leonhard standing in front of the door. He says he wants to tell her something. She tells him to not call her by the title as she's no longer at night. Leonhard tells her to also just call him Leonhard or just Leon. Alon wonders if they are so close to start calling each other so casually. He asks if she still remembers what he said to her. Alon remembers him asking if he could be the father of the child. She says she does remember, but that it's not possible now, and that was a long time ago. He tells her that his feelings have not changed. He wants to be someone who can be relied on. He asks why she's trying to go where he cannot reach her, having tears in his eyes. He moves to grab her hand when someone calls him from behind. He hopes to listen to a different answer the next time he asks and leaves. Alon gets conflicted and sits down. Alon returns to the room and finds that the children are asleep because they are tired from the journey. 
She also plans to go to sleep but remembers what Leonard said about her going out of reach. She wonders about it for some time, then goes to sleep. The Emperor wakes her up and she's surprised to find him in her room. She soon realizes that it is a dream. She tells him not to invade her dreams. He asks her what she and Leonhardt were talking about. She tells him that he was worried about her as a colleague, but the Emperor already knows that they are on a first name basis and suggests she only remain a colleague. The next day, Alana's tired because she could not sleep. They arrive at Alito, the capital of the Empire, and the Emperor offers her his hand, but she refuses. He tells her that she's going to be living in the Wind Palace. Alana's confused because only the Empress is supposed to live in the Wind Palace. The Emperor says that she's going to be an Empress soon, and this makes Alana beyond shocked. The Emperor shows her around the palace. He takes them to the children's room and a room for Alana. Alana gets a feeling that someone was using this room. The Emperor introduces the headmaid of Wind Palace, Malaka, and leaves. Alan wants to ask her about it, but she stops herself. And Ril finds Kyle written on a book in his room and shows it to Leanne. They think that this is the name of the person who used to live in this room and find more stuff with the name on it. Alan arrives in the children's show as well. She remembers the time when the Emperor said he used to read books. At that time, she thought that he was lying to gain sympathy. She thinks that even if the Emperor had a tough childhood, that does not excuse all of the cruel things that he has done. The more one gets to know a person, the more he sympathizes with them. That is why she did not want to know more about the Emperor. The children ask if they know this person, but she refuses and tells them to clean up. Malaka enters the room and invites them for dinner. On the way, Leah notices a cloth portrait and asks about it. Malaka tells them that it is the portrait of the previous resident of the palace. Leanne wants to look at it, so Malaka removes the cloth. She tells them that the woman in the portrait is the previous mistress of the Wind Palace, Eugene, and her son, Kylar. The children become excited to know that the boy is Kyle. Alan tells them to keep it a secret because they read the book without Kyle's permission and he would not be happy about it. Malaka tells them not to worry as he would not be angry to use his things because the children are adorable. Alan also thinks so, but she wants to keep the children away from the Emperor. Arisa sits in her room. She belongs to the Crescent family who helped the Emperor rise to the throne after he was abandoned as a prince. She wants all the love and power. A servant tells her that food was delivered to the Wind Palace. She tells them to investigate as no one is allowed to go to that palace. Rumors started about the new resident in the Wind Palace. Alan realizes and gets worried because the nobles will try to harm her and the children. She wants to get out of here but cannot get away from Malacca. The children are playing in the garden when Leanne finds a black pony. She pets the pony but Enrilla is worried that it might belong to someone and tells her not to touch it. The Emperor rides and asks if they like it. Leanne praises the pony for its beauty. The Emperor shows them a white pony and tells them that they can ride these as they are the owners now. The children ask Alan if they can ride them. Alan realizes that these are Persian ponies that are very expensive. She wants to refuse the gift, but the children love ponies so much that she cannot do so. The Emperor asks Alan if she would like to come with the children to ride ponies. She tells them that it's hard to take care of two children, so she goes. The Emperor smiles after hearing that. Alan is reminded of the portrait when she thinks that the Emperor has been smiling a lot after arriving here. The Emperor helps Leanne to sit on the pony and she thanks him. She also apologizes for calling him the Demon King before. The Emperor is happy to hear that. Alan also thanks him for saving the children. The Emperor turns his face after hearing that. Alan is curious to know why he hit his face. The children ask the Emperor how they should address him because their mother calls him Your Majesty. He tells them to call him Kylar. The children ask if he is Kyle. The Emperor affirms him as Kyle. The children become excited and ask if he likes storybooks because there are a lot of books in the room. He tells him that he likes books with dragons in them. They start asking him other questions as well, but Alan tells them not to ask many questions at once. She notices the Emperor smiling and happy. The Emperor tells them to continue the conversation in the shade as the sun is getting hot. The children follow the Emperor. Alan thinks that he looks more like a father as she watches them leave. She soon comes to track and thinks that this should not be a touching sense. The Emperor is only being nice to the children to make her lower her guard. The Emperor notices her not moving and asks if she's coming with, calling her a rabbit. She is shocked that he would call her a rabbit in front of the children. He tells her that she looks like the pet rabbit he had when he was young. Alan is put after hearing that and asks if he likes her because she looks like his pet. The Emperor tells her that he was attracted to her from the start when she was cursing your superior behind his back. Alan tells him to stop, but Leanne says she wants to hear more. The Emperor asks if she's attracted to him after hearing that. Alan says that he lied to her and locked her up in the palace, so how can she feel attraction for him? The Emperor tells her that she's not locked, she can go whenever she wants as long as she does not take the children with her. He knows that she will not run away without her children. 
Alon goes out of the Wind Palace and meets Leonhard coincidentally. He tells her not to let her guard down around the Emperor as he's being nice for now. Arisa gets informed about Alon living in the Wind Palace with her two children. She gets angry and decides to go to the Imperial Castle. Thank you so much for watching. Please check out these other videos and make sure to subscribe and press that bell icon to know about our latest videos.